So now we have um, questions and discussions. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Barbara. Yes, we've got plenty of time for questions and discussion. So if you haven't already, feel free to put in your comment or your question in the chat. We do have a number already kind of mini discussions happening there. Uh, I think the biggest question might be, will the slides be available? And yes, we will share a copy of today's slides on the Train the Trainer webpage at the conclusion of this week's training. So go ahead and bookmark our Train the Trainer resource page so that you can uh, look back on that uh, page whenever you have an opportunity next week. We'll post all of the toolkits. So all of the tools that you saw today are available on that page already. Um, the adherence monitoring tool, the big six sign, the pamphlet, all of those are already there. So if you wanna go ahead and check that out, um, feel free to do that. I'm going to invite um, both Sheila and Barbara, as well as we have Shantala Ahanya, who is also one of our HEI program IPs, to help me navigate the chat and see if we can bring up any of these questions and respond. Erin, um, I'm going to group. I'll start with the, uh, grouping some of these questions because we can answer in uh, more in wide variety. Um, Barbara, uh, Sheila, one of you can take the question. Um, maybe I'll start with uh, Barbara. So the question, uh, sorry, Sheila, uh, what, the first slide that they are asking about who needs to be on ESP. Uh, if you want to go ahead and then talk about uh, who needs to be on ESP. I think it was on a couple of our first slides. Sheila. Okay, okay yes, sure. Um, thank you, Chantala. The, any individual that is, um, so we remember we we're trying to evaluate the risk of transmission of MDROs. So what we're looking for are patients that um, have indwelling devices, such as G2, fakes, and so on, um, central lines, or patients with um, unhealed wounds, such as the cubitus ulcers are a good example of that. Those are the, uh, uh, I saw a few questions as well um, regarding um, sort of ties in saying, um, what about people with MDROs? So remember, we're looking at risk here, not um, knowing whether somebody has an MDRO or not. Thank you, Sheila. Can you cover for uh, anybody if if, uh, if they have a dialysis resident and who has a, a shunt or a fistula, do they need to be on ESP? Yes. Um, so any any patient, a, a fistula or a shunt, are, are not considered in dwelling devices. They are not open. Um, they have skin, healed skin over them. So those would not be a factor, a risk factor for ESP. Thank you, Sheila. So Barbara, this question is for you. Um, do they need to uh, wear gown when they're emptying the fully catheter bag? Um, yes, that would be a, a high risk activity. So you would want to because of the possibility of contaminating the uh, the scrubs, you'd want to make sure that gloves and gowns are worn uh, when that's um, addressed. Thank you, Barbara. To add to the next question regarding PPE is on face shield. A lot of questions comes up on that. Do I, as part of the ESP, do they need to wear face shield? So. Oh, yeah, okay. so. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, face shield is part of standard precautions. So this is enhanced standard precautions. So uh, face shield any time as uh, dictated by standard precautions um, is appropriate, really, whether a patient is on ESP or not. So uh, considering that um, risk in uh, patient care uh, globally is uh, the appropriate response. Thank you, Barbara. Sheila, next question to you. It's regarding the, uh, uh, when they're giving the medication to the staff, need, oral medication, do the staff need to wear gloves? Um, um, so, and then they're usually, uh, they give them the medication in a cup, and do they still need to wear uh, gloves? Current practice is only hand hygiene. Yeah. So um, again, we want to we want to really uh, hone into those six moments that we were talking about. Um, 
Giving medication is one of those activities that we will be using gloves and gowns. So if the patient has a wound that's not healing or um, an indwelling device and you have to um, give them medication, then you would be uh, putting your PPE on and then um, you know, doing hand hygiene, putting the PPE on and then um, re removing and doing hand hygiene at the end. So that, those little examples, I'm sorry, um, are very, you know, it's a good thing to really uh, memorize those six moments that it'll help um, answer those uh, those questions on specific tasks. Thank you, Sheila. To add to what Sheila said, you you first and foremost, you have to think about if that resident is on enhanced standard precaution, if that pay resident meets the uh, criteria for enhanced standard precaution, then the staff needs to wear uh, gloves. Um, again, um, as uh, Barbara uh, showed us the, the resources available and you have uh, the document gives you more uh, explanation um, and it has a table uh, um, which gives you when to use gloves and when to use gown and gloves. Um, the next question, Barbara, for you is uh, regarding the signage. Do they need to place the signage uh, outside the room or can they, uh, so if we can give some examples of signage where they can place it? Right, um, so the short answer is it is up to your facility where the signage for ESP goes. Um, for consistency, because with transmission-based precautions, which this is not, um, but in traditional transmission-based precautions, you're going to place that sign outside the door. So your facility may decide for consistency and will keep that practice. Um, or your facility, though, you do have the flexibility to say, actually, for our facility, we want the signage for ESP placed above the resident bed, uh, head of the bed. Uh, that might work better for your facility. So I really think this is a discussion for um, you guys to ask your uh, frontline staff what would be best for them, ask your leadership what they think, and come to a consensus so that you are moving forward in a, um, a aligned practice amongst your facility staff so that um, uh, you know everybody can speak to it where you are. Thank you, Barbara. Um, Sheila, this question for you back to the uh, dialysis so that they need some clarification to say uh, why the shunt and the uh, uh, resident with the fistula doesn't need to be on ESP. Okay, um, yes. So a shunt or a fistula is not considered an indwelling device because although it is implanted, there is healed skin over over your stunt or fistula. So it is accessed frequently, but nevertheless, it is not a, a, an open wound, um, open to air with any drainage, but you know, unless there's an infection in it. Um, but again, so that is the rationale behind why it's not considered an end volume device. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, Barbara, this question is uh, regarding the um, using the, uh, the PPE when passing the medication. So since we said that they had to use gloves during when they're passing the medication, so they're talking about the meal tray. When do they need to wear a gown and gloves when they're passing the meal tray? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, it is a little bit different. A meal tray is in terms of the uh, projected uh, um, contact with the resident. So a meal tray is, is not considered one of those moments um, for ESP. So hopefully that will make your dietary staff really happy. Um, just making sure the hand hygiene is performed um, as, as a standard practice. Thank you, Barbara. To add to when you're feeding the patient, if you're feeding the patient, if you're coming in close contact, again, you always look at the, high contact uh, um, activity. So if it is a high contact activity, uh, you had to consider using the PPE. It's so always do your uh, risk assessment on the activities and then uh, develop your uh, policy. Um, the next question is uh, regarding um, 
do we need to have a two different barrel for a laundry and PPE in the in the inside the room? Barbara, do you want me to take that question? Sure. Uh, so this is uh, um, again, if your laundry is for uh, if you're using the reusable gowns, so then that goes to laundry. So if it just goes to the dirty laundry, it's the same laundry bas uh, uh, bas uh, barrel you're using. So then that can go into that. If it is uh, disposable PPE, that needs to go into the trash. So it's up to the facility. So what is your process? So you don't have to have a special barrel. It's not a biohazard. Um, uh, so when you're using, it's a regular uh, um, trash. Um, so for the your gown and gloves, there is no special handling, even for the meal trays, for that matter. Um, and uh, so uh, next one is for you, Sheila. Um, so the uh, draining wound should be in contact precaution. So I think this is the coding question for the MDS. So not sure about uh, the coding question, Sheila, if you have any any answer to that. Um, uh, it's the... Oh. So the go ahead. Sorry, Chancellor, if you do if go ahead and share that I am not aware of, um, you know, the coding questions, how to address the, that question. Yeah. Yes. So right now, so we we don't have the, the um, your MDS should be able to let you know if they are coding for contact precaution. I think it is part of the contact precaution. So when you place the resident in a contact precaution, you're coding. So that is part of the draining wounds will be part of that. So I don't think that is a separate one, uh, but check with your MDS. Uh, but if we have more information, we'll bring it to you uh, during office hours. Um, Aaron, did I miss anything else? So a lot of PPE question. And if there is no other PPE question, oh, the, I think there the question is regarding, are we, um, able to provide, like, are we supporting the supplies? Uh, no, <laughs> sorry about that. I know <laughs> during COVID, we did, uh, state was able to provide. So this is, uh, we are not able to provide um, the PPE supplies uh, uh, for the facility. Um, you had to, um, again, so, the next portion, like it's, we are also this, we are also looking at the high risk patient population who may, who may acquire uh, due to our, our uh, infection control practices. They may acquire uh, multi drug resistant organisms or any organism for that matter. So you are also transitioning some of your contact precaution, colonized contact precaution resident to an enhanced standard precaution. So. When you're looking at your uh, um, practices, you you will balance it out. So what we have seen in some of the facilities who have implemented, and when we have some time, so we can open up for some of you already have implemented how it is helping you to prevent uh, an, um, any outbreak in your building. So, but to answer your question, no, we are not uh, at this point. We are not providing any PPE supplies. Um, and I think, uh, Aaron, it said, okay. Um, how long will the ESB implemented? Barbara, question for you. Right. So, um, this is a ongoing assessment that nursing will be, uh, conducting. So, uh, you know, if there's a change in the resident status, then um, either we can uh, start a resident on ESP or discontinue. For example, if they were on ESP because they have a Foley catheter and we're able to discontinue that fully and they don't have any other risk factors, then we discontinue the ESP. Thank you, Barbara. Um, okay, so again, there is a lot of PPE questions. Um, Sheila, the uh, next question on PPE is uh, when passing the uh, medication, the staff, the uh, the nurses can wear gloves. They can use gloves, but there is no need for gown. Um, is that true? Okay, so we go back to if 
if the patient or the room itself is um, the residents are under ESP, then passing medication is one of the six moments. And of course, it's the six moments we do wear um, gowns and gloves for those activities. So remember, I know it, um, it may seem relatively quick what you're doing, but you're still coming into close contact with the patient, the resident, and or their environment. So um, it would be, you would be wearing the gowns and the gloves for passing medication. Thank you, Sheila. Just yeah. to give a little bit of more clarification on that. So there are situations, you may have a situation where you have a resident on a, with a, um, a fully catheter who's on a fully catheter, uh, who has fully catheter and you're giving the medication to that so that the resident is able to take the medication on their own. Uh, so then it's you don't have that high contact activity. It's more of you're passing the medication. They're taking the medication, uh, oral medication. So then uh, gloves is good. Um, again, so we have that reference in our table. Uh, but if they are, if they have a G-tube, so then you are uh, uh, giving the medication through G-tube. Uh, so then you, as uh, Sheila mentioned, so you are coming in high contact activity. Uh, then you had to use your gown and gloves. Um, the next question, Barbara, is for does therapy need to wear uh, PPE in the gym for res uh, uh, um, ESP residents? Yeah, so I can handle that one. Um, it, it, it's something really you need to be talking with your physical therapy staff about. So in general, they are going to be um, put into a clean gown as part of ESP. So um, because they're going to be arriving to physical therapy in a clean gown, um, in general, no. But like we've talked about, the different types of activities. So um, if they're going to be really closely um, involved, um, I would just make sure that you know they, they, they're not doing something that would then fit one of the six moments. So I would in general answer that is no, but review the six moments with your physical therapy and occupational therapy staff and make sure that everybody is in agreement with that, with the level of services that they are providing in your unique situation. Thank you, Barbara. Again, as Barbara mentioned, so you had to do your uh, risk assessment. Uh, there are some residents who are going to be on ESP will be more independent because they, even though they have devices. So, but if you are uh, some residents with the devices are going to be more uh, dependent. Uh, so then you are, if you're coming in contact with them, making sure that as Barbara said, do your risk assessment and uh, make sure your therapy staff are uh, trained and also making sure that you have PPE supplies uh, in the therapy room. Uh, the next question is uh, there are about uh, Cheryl has too much of gowns in, in her hands, 800 gowns that expired on 5 11 2023. Can I still use them? I think, yes, you should be able to use them. Uh, but uh, um, uh, manufacturer guideline, even though they give you the expiration date, we can. Uh, the first thing we always recommend you to reach out to your manufacturer and uh, make sure there is uh, uh, um, confirmation from them. Uh, but uh, they do have a um, the time within like the then you you are able to use them for. Uh, within the three months, a month period or the 30 days extension or 20, uh, 60 days extension, you really need to ask your manufacturer uh, to uh, get the confirmation from them or email confirmation because your surveyors may uh, look into that and uh, you, uh, with the expired. Even if it is not expired, so one thing we always need to think about is if the, depending mm -hmm. on the quality of the gown, so uh, if it is ripped, right? So then sometimes you have, a, uh, we have seen very cheaper quality of gowns, which is uh, ripped sometimes, even it is not expired. It's a brand new one, you open up the bag. And uh, so that needs to be discarded. So you always need to look at not just the, uh, so, but for the uh, expired one, check with the manufacturer to get the um, uh, email or confirmation 
to it is okay for you to use does uh, uh, sheila the next question is um, does laundry need to be need to wash linen separate uh, with someone on esp versus someone who is not on esp yeah, um, so laundry doesn't have any special precautions or handling. Um, it's treated the way all, all of the other residents' laundry is. That's why you also don't need a separate receptacle to contain it. Same with the trash. So um, you don't need any special processing. Thank you, Sheila. Mm -hmm. uh, Barbara, is ESP and EBP are the same? That's a good question. Um, so ESP is enhanced standard precautions and is what is suggested to be implemented by the California Department of Public Health. EBP is enhanced barrier precautions, which is rolled out by the Centers for Disease Control on a national level. So in California, we have looked at EBP and we have, uh, they're, they're fairly in line, but there are some instances where they are not in line. And we are recommending you use ESP for the unique situations that occur in the state of California. Thank you. Um, to add to the next question to you, Barbara, to it's almost uh, related to the same question. Um, so um, does re resident have to have an infection in order to be on ESP? Yeah, another good question. Um, actually, we're gonna put, uh, we're gonna evaluate the residents and uh, we will be initiating ESP based on their risk factors um, of an indwelling device or a uh, unhealed wound. Thank you. Um, so um, Sheila, next question to you is, do, uh, do residents who have Foley catheter for more than a year, do they need to be on ESP? So um, again, if the indwelling catheter um, is still in the patient, the risk is still there for con contamination of the patient's environment or activities that you will be doing um, with that Foley catheter. So yes, you would still be implementing ESP for the patient with that patient. Thank you. I um, think uh, there's another question where it says, uh, can we put color coded sticker to differentiate who is on ESP in a multi bedroom along with ESP sign? Barbara, you want to take that? Um, you can. Uh... You know, again, depending on how your facility decides to, you know, talk it over with your staff and with your leaders as to why an additional sticker would be needed. But if you find that that is 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 helpful in your situation, um, you you in fact are able to. Um, the flexibility is yours. Thank you, Barbara. I, I do really like the, the chat going on because there are some of you are answering each other. Uh, again, so this is uh, looking at that. Um, yes, there is a more cl a clarification is needed, but at the same time, I we are really happy to see some of you uh, already have the understanding. Uh, so uh, Sheila, next question to you is, is ESP recommended or required? Yeah, so um, thanks for asking that question. ESP is strongly recommended, but it is not a requirement um, by CDPH, but it is something that would, as mentioned in the presentation, enhance um, also the residents' experience at your facility. Because although today we're focusing a lot on when we have to use the PPE for the patients and with what activities, there's also, um, other opportunities that um, this would afford the patient would not have to be wearing PPE. And those are going to common areas or having visitors um, without wearing them unless they're participating in the care, those high con uh, risk contact activities, then they would, but then um, they don't need to if they're not participating. So um, again, that is some of the things we would like um, facilities to consider when uh, considering to implement uh, ESP. 
Thank you, Sheila. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next question we have is, what is the reasonable uh, distance for placement of PPE? Does it have to be in uh, in room or can I have staff draw from a hallway centralized location? Um, Barbara, do you want to take that question? Yeah, um, we're not we're not regulating that. We're not requiring that. I think it might be hard just from a practical perspective if you have it in a centralized location and not closer to every room. Um, so I would look at that. I would definitely be, um, I would watch that process and see if it's you know convenient for your staff. Maybe you like roll it out as it's a change first and, and then get feedback from your staff because I would be concerned that they wouldn't have what they needed where they needed it most. Um, but uh, again, if it works in your facility, maybe you know there's not a lot of distance and there's a common area you can get that in, then um, it would be fine. I would just be concerned. Um, but look at it in your facility. Thank you, Barbara. Um, to add to what Barbara said, there are facilities where they have a space inside the room where uh, none of the residents has access to that. So then there is, uh, you can place them. It's a, uh, it's as easy accessibility is the key here for, as Barbara said. Um, so the next question is uh, um, regarding the PPE for visitors. Uh, Sheila, you covered it a little bit uh, previous question. Do you want to take it again on the, for the vis- visitors needing PPE? Yes, for sure. Um, so if a patient is on ASP, a visitor does not need to wear PPE unless they are participating in those high contact um, activities. Those mentioned in the six moments, if you know there's visitors that do um, participate in all those activities with their loved one. So if they will be doing those activities, they will be asked to wear PPE and gloves and hand hygiene, but um, not if they're not. I hope that clarifies it. Yes, you are right. So it's only if they're doing the um, activity, like uh, turning the patient, changing the patient. Uh, so there is so many of those. And then we have seen the uh, the family members will be feeding the those, uh, the residents. Uh, so anytime they have a high contact activity, again, we wanted to make sure. Uh, the risk is less for the visitors, I understand, but because again, some we have seen those visitors coming back to the nursing station, going everywhere. So because they are those family members are a regular uh, with, uh, visitors. So uh, we just wanted to make sure that there is no uh, contamination in your nursing station either. So uh, the next question, Barbara, uh, regarding the, uh, the MDRO. Uh, cases. So for a patient with a crab or a CRA colonized, can we put them on ESP instead of isolation? Good question. So um, you have your traditional um, traditional um, transmission-based precautions. Um, isolation is one of those transmission-based precautions. And then you have ESP. So for organisms um, like crab and CRE, Um, and I'll put in CRS there, uh, based on the prevalence in the community and also in the outbreak status of the facility is gonna determine whether or not they are placed on um, contact isolation or not. So you have to look at those numbers first in contact in conjunction, I mean, with your uh, local public health department and you will know whether or not you guys are in outbreak status or not. So that is the uh, first consideration. And then um, you would risk assess those patients to see if they um, uh, meet ESP criteria. But you first need to determine uh, contact isolation separate from ESP. Thank you, Barbara. Based on your prevalence factors. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's we have uh, uh, three more minutes, and then I will hand it over to Erin. Erin, uh, uh, let me know if you need it, if you need more time. I think there is uh, a lot of questions regarding the um, uh, 
PPE. So we will bring bring it bring back those questions uh, during our office hours to if we did not cover. Um, couple of questions related to sur surveyor. If a surveyor comes in and see the, the nurse giving the medication to with, without using the gowns, so will they get deficiency? And there was an another question uh, whether um, are they going to get any citation when they when the facility have their infection control survey? Um, Barbara, uh, Sheila, do you want to take or do you want me to cover it? Well, I mean, I can start, and then I'm you know welcome to 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 chime in. Um, so the surveyors are also being trained on ESP so that we have a consistent message and a consistent uh, rollout with this. So uh, what I would encourage you to do is to follow the six moments as we've laid out here um, uh, in order to make sure you are in compliance with the recommended infection control practices as per the state of California. So when you are doing that, um, and a surveyor is in your, your building and asking questions, then um, you will be able to answer those questions and address their concerns. So I don't mean to be overly general, but um, everybody is learning the same, uh, learning from the same toolkit. So there should not be a situation where there is discrepant um, results from what uh, CDPHHEI is teaching now to what is being surveyed for in the future. And if you feel like there is something discrepant, then uh, please bring it up at the time of survey so it can be adjusted in real time. Thank you, Barbara. Um, I think right now, uh, as uh, you, um, making sure that you, if you are planning to implement or if you have already implemented ESP, uh, look at your policy and procedure. What uh, what is your policies and procedure? Uh, is ask um, uh, so whatever you put in your policy and procedure is what the uh, the surveyors will be looking at. Uh, and uh, if you have uh, any questions related to uh, that, so you can uh, let us know uh, if there is any help needed uh, to uh, in addition to help you with your policy and procedure. Um, the second question, uh, this one is uh, regarding if, um, I mean, this is a case scenario, uh, Sheila. So if a patient on a Foley catheter with a history of MDRO and is dependent with the ADL care, do CNAs need to wear PPE while feeding or repositioning the patient, even though they're not coming in contact with the Foley? Do nurses need to wear PPE to provide medication? It's a twofold question. Um, do you want to start? Okay, so it's saying that a patient um, with an MDRO, sorry, it was a lot of information, it, it has yes. a Foley. Uh, yeah, Foley catheter, and then in a situation, there may be a Foley catheter or it's a total ADL, uh, ADL yeah. care. So does the CNA need to wear PPE while feeding or repositioning the patient even though they're not coming in contact with the Foley. Okay, so, you know, that patient, depending on what the MDRO is, um, may already be in contact precautions. So you're going to be wearing um, all of your personal protective equipment, um, unless you've already worked with your public health and you established that um, they can now uh, be transitioned to ESP then you would look at the risk factors. It sounds to me like the risk factors are still present and the activities that um, you, you're going to be doing if they're close with the patient because they require help with all of the ADLs, if I'm correct, and if I remember correctly, then you would still want to wear um, your PPE when providing care for that patient. And feel free to chime in, Chantala, if you have more to Thank add. You. Thank mm -hmm. you, Sheila. Um, I'm going to answer um, that question and then one more question and then I'll pass it on to uh, pass it on to um, Aaron. Um, yes, if they have a history of MDRO and uh, 
uh, if they are on uh, enhanced standard precaution, if they're uh, so, yes, they need to wear uh, PPE because then we're not just caught talking about the contact with the Foley catheter. We are talking about the contact with the resident and the resident environment. Um, and I think there is a, um, again, the two sign, ESP signage and then the contact precaution. No, either you're re you, you're re the resident either is on contact precaution or enhanced standard precaution. So they're not going to be on both enhanced mm -hmm. standard precaution as well as contact. With that, I will pass it on to Aaron. Uh, Aaron, <laughs> take it away. And then the, something which we are not covered today will be covered during our office hours. Yeah, this is excellent discussion. Thank you to Chantal and Sheila and Barbara for uh, toggling that <laughs> wonderful discussion. There are a number of questions still in the chat. I realize we don't have time to answer all of them now, but um, again, we have office hours next week. Uh, feel Please join. And then there was a question in the chat asking if every day this week will cover um, the same ESP kind of material. And the answer is yes. However, you're welcome to join maybe for additional discussion um, if you'd like to join, you know, for this latter part of, of, of all of those sessions this week. 